1.5 billion media impressions uh, about the film, including 40,000 organic press articles written. You want to gouge the eyes, right? You want to cup and slap and, and, and potentially burst the eardrum. You want to attack the throat, the groin. The engaged brain is easier to knock out. There's studies that have shown that. The tip of his elbow hit me in the, right in the eyeball and my orbital floor blew out. So I had what's called a trapdoor fracture. That would make it the most viewed documentary of all time. James Wilkes, thank you very much for coming on the show. Andy, thanks for having me. Mate, the documentary. God, what's the response been like? It was a, it's, a, it's gone pretty well, isn't it? Yeah, it's been incredible. So, um, I mean, we've had 1.5 billion media impressions uh, about the film, including 40,000 organic press articles written. Um, interest in plant-based eating more than tripled worldwide within weeks of the film hitting Netflix, according to uh, many metrics uh, on Google Trends. Really? And... Uh, our estimates, Netflix, and then also Yoku, which is sort of a, a Netflix equivalent in China, don't give their numbers. Um, but we've had sort of analysis done. We think it's at least 75 million, probably well over 100 million. Um, and so it, that would make it the most viewed documentary of all time. Holy hecka. I mean, has yeah. that surprised you a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we knew, we thought we'd have a big splash, but I don't think that it would have... I don't think we ever imagined that it would have been that big, uh, mm -hmm. right? So it's just had a huge impact. I think the timing is right. Like the world is ready for to hear that message. Um, but didn't think it would be that big. And it's just been massive. And we're still getting, I think we're still getting like 120,000 new visits per month to our website, which, you know, obviously it's only, as, I think that we could have like 10% of people uh, go to see the film. There was some estimates go to see the website. So that would mean there's still 1.2 million new uh, viewers per month of the of the documentary, um, and then it was the best-selling uh, documentary of all time on iTunes before that, and uh, even on pre-sales it was beating uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Toy Story 4, Lion King 2. Um, so yeah, it just had a huge uh, viewership, and I think that's translated to a lot of impact. And personally, now I, I, it's hard for me to go anywhere. Uh, the grocery store, Home Depot. The uh, meat section and the grocery restaurant. store, you can't be seen there. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, the gym. You know, it's hard for me to go anywhere without people coming up and saying, hey, saw the film. You know, not everyone's gone all the way plant-based, but, it, you know, some people have gone, their whole family's gone, you know, they'll tell me, or they've gone 80% plant-based or whatever. So it's, it's having a huge impact. Yeah, it's a massive stars on there. Yeah, would have sort of talked me through some of the, the big names that, have stopped eating meat and and what effect it's it's had on them yeah if you just look at our executive producers right we had sort of the film folks right like james cameron arnold schwarzenegger jackie chan but then on the athlete side if you look at uh chris paul who's a 10-time nba all-star and president of the national basketball uh, players association or novak djokovic who's the number one uh tennis player in the world male tennis player um you know, he just won the French Open, which he was not expected to win. He's on a clay court, which is not really his specialty. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, who's just, uh, I think it's like six-time uh, world uh, champion, Formula One. So, you know, they were all executive producers on the film. If you see what they've done since going plant-based, um, just incredible uh, performance. So, mm. um, and of course, there's a bunch of other athletes that are sort of, uh, you know, plant forward, like Tom Brady, um, uh, Serena. In the NFL. And, uh, yeah, and Venus Williams. There's a bunch of people. And, and we like to say it's not all or nothing, it's all or something, right? So the science shows that in terms of health and which uh, seems to translate to athletic performance, that just shifting in that more plant-based direction, getting more whole plant foods in your diet is going to be beneficial. So we're not trying to tell people you've got to go vegan, you've got to go vegetarian, but you know we're sort of encouraging plant-forward eating, basically. Mm. A point that a lot of people make about the, a major criticism of the documentary is that it was very one-sided towards like there, there wasn't any any balance really was there the the thought that you need meat is so commonplace right and this idea that pro you know the the protein is better quality and you get protein from meat it so exists in, in society that it's it almost seems like, why would you present that side? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, it's not like we went and cherry picked a bunch of vegan doctors. Half of the experts on, uh, uh, on the film were not vegan. 
So they'd say, you know, even anthropologists say, look, we're really built to eat plants. And then when we stop filming, they'd eat a turkey sandwich. Uh, because you can have a doctor that knows all about smoking and says smoking is bad for you. It doesn't mean he's not going to smoke. So it's not like we cherry picked people that had, um, we literally got the head of nutrition at Harvard, the head of anthropology at Harvard, the president of the American College of Cardiology, the lead delegate for urology for the American Medical Association. These were the types of experts that we had in the film. And so we reached out to the leading experts and there's sort of this general consensus and people can argue between 90% plant-based, 95% plant-based, the hundred percent plant-based, right? But the consensus of the organizations and the world's leading experts is that we should be eating uh, plant-centered diets. So it would be. What do you mean by plant-centered diets? So that plant-centered diets means, is, does that mean like with me as well, but mainly plants? Like a or, plant, uh, plant, like a plant-forward or plant-centered or plant-exclusive. Like all of the organizations recommend those things, right? So, for example, the Academy of uh, Nutrition and Dietetics says that vegan and vegetarian diets are helpful for all stages of the life cycle, including uh, pregnancy, infancy, you know, adolescence, adulthood, including for athletes and pregnant people, uh, and that it may confer some health benefits over eating a standard mm -hmm. diet. So people recognize that you can be completely helpful, both experts and large, the largest organizations on a completely vegan diet, but they also recognize that there's benefit to shifting uh, into uh plant centered diets yeah i liked what um i'm sort of more on the i don't want to compare myself to arnold schwarzenegger but um where he was saying maybe just take a day off like take like or, or don't you, you don't need to um necessarily go full vegan full vegetarian but yeah, just kind of just kind of cut down a little bit um, yeah he, he personally so just think in terms of arnold because some people came out saying oh he's not vegan we know he didn't yeah. say he was vegan right he tried to say like do one day a week or whatever <clears throat> um, what we've heard from Arnold uh, is that he hasn't drink, uh, drank milk for years and years and years. He says milk is for babies. Uh, and then um, in terms of meat, he's cut down his meat consumption by 80%. So that's a significant change, right? Like, although he might have started one day a week, he's made a significant change. And that's going to have a material impact on his health and, of course, on the environment as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, it's not all or nothing. It's all or something. Um, and I think the way to think about it is not excluding things, but like trying new plant-based things. And what you'll tend to find is like, after you eat those things, you might start feeling a bit better and you just start trying a few more things and it crowds those other things out. Going back to Arnie, did you, did you hang out with him? Like, I mean, how big is he? Is he, a, he's obviously massive. He's still got it though, hasn't he? Yeah, he's still got, I know there was a period where, you know, he's had some uh, heart issues from when he was like, he's got some congenital heart issues of which he's yeah. had surgery for. Uh, and I think when he's had those issues, obviously lost, you know, he's not been able to work out as much and lost some size. So there's been some times in the past, but you know, yeah, I've got a couple of photos with him. I've never posted actually, but. D did you manage to keep your call around him? You didn't throw any like Terminator quotes? Like what was it like when you first, first no, met we him? No, tried to, we tried to get some Terminator quotes out of him, but he was actually, it was about an hour late to the interview because he was doing some other charity work and he showed up and sat down. He says, right, I've got two minutes. And we were thinking, you know, we've set up all this, like we've got the couple of cameras on these moving pods and sound and we've been waiting and he's like, we've got two minutes. And we were thinking, no, we need like at least 10 minutes. And uh, he said, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, he was, he was great. Um, haven't had the opportunity to hang out with him much. He did come in and watch a screening. Um, funny thing was he came to watch a screening and, and Jim Cameron said, hey, Arnold, come watch this Game Changer screening. So Arnold came and he was sitting right in front of me and he was watching it and it looked like he was enjoying it. And then afterwards he turned around and said, uh, you know what, I was watching it. I was thinking, why didn't they interview me for this film? He didn't, he didn't know because it had been a couple of years since we interviewed him. Uh, he didn't know that the interview that he did, because he does so many interviews, right? Right. Was, was part of this, it was the same film. So he's watching the, and like halfway through he thought to myself, he said, I thought to myself, why didn't they include me for this film? They should have interviewed me. And then all of a sudden I popped up on the screen. <laughs> he said, and so... <laughs> That, that was pretty cool. What, what do you put in your smoothie? I have a smoothie each morning. I put protein mix in it. But what, so what do you actually put in your smoothie? Yeah, if I'm in a rush, I will use um, uh, a protein uh, powder. But usually I'm, uh, I don't have that rush or I'll get it ready the night before or whatever. And so it'll have a cup of soy milk, a cup of greens, a cup of berries or cherries, um, one tablespoon of flaxseed, one tablespoon of pumpkin seed, uh, one tablespoon of hemp seed. 
Uh, I'll actually put some peas in there, frozen peas straight in. Yeah. You can't even taste it. Yeah, and you get some, you know, more legumes in there, which is one of the best foods, one of the best foods you can eat, you know, legumes like beans and greens. Uh, so greens is one and then beans is a legume or lentils, some of the best foods you can eat on, on the planet. Um, uh, what else do I put in there? One Brazil nut for the selenium. I always make I eat a Brazil nut every day. Right. Um, so that's in there. Um, that right. What else? Yeah, that's uh, I'm sure I'm missing something there, but that's uh, oh, some beet powder. Yeah. And I do do two, uh, and I put creatine in actually as well three grams of uh, creatine uh, just went on days that I'm working out, which is right. usually about five or six days a week. You have been training Navy SEALs, right? Got any good stories on that? Like you, cause those guys are hard as fuck. Like I no, know that yeah, I know you've got skills, but they're hard. Oh no, totally. Um, and yeah, I haven't got anything uh, negative to say about them, but there's been some groups where, and definitely not the Navy SEALs, but there's been some groups where you think these guys are going to be like really good fighters or whatever. And they've got their skill set where they're really good at shooting and really good at like skydiving and halo, like high altitude, low opening and all this sort of stuff. But it doesn't naturally, it doesn't always make them amazing fighters. I remember when I was, I was quite young, I was probably like 23 and I went in to train the Marines and they weren't really listening to me, uh, you know, because I was young and they were thinking, who's this kid, you know? training mm -hmm. me and I was teaching something called the rapid assault tactics, which is basically you, you enter in with an eye jab or something called a destruction where someone throws a punch, you, and you block it with the point of your elbow, right? To cause some pain. You do something called a straight blast where you're running at them with these sort of circular punches. And then you go in, you thumb the eyes, head, butt, uh, elbow and knee, and they just weren't paying much attention. And then uh, I taught this move, uh, this knee destruction. So in, when someone kicks you, instead of blocking it with your arm or your leg, you, you point the tip of your knee um, you know, you bend your heel up so that, that you take the kick on the point of your knee. And then once they started kicking each other and, and they, you know, a few of them caught the point of the knee. And by the way, I've seen multiple legs snap uh, from that technique. Um, once they started doing that, they were like hopping around, holding their shins. They, I think they started realizing that what I was teaching was uh, legitimate and they, they started <laughs> listening. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the Navy SEALs, I have a huge respect for what they do. Uh, there's no way I could do any of that, um, the stuff that they do, like the, the water stuff and just incredibly tough guys. And uh, of course, they're athletic too. So they, they pick that stuff up really quickly. What kind of, what are the main bits of advice that you, you, you give to Navy SEALs? Because obviously, they're definitely going to need some skills to kill people. Uh, but also like you've got limited time with them. So you must have a, a couple of really crucial sets of drills or a couple of really crucial yeah. Like, I'm going to poke you in the eye and this is as good as you're going to get. I don't yeah, know. I mean, it's not, actually, it's, it's funny you say that, right? Because no one builds muscle over their eyes, their throat, and their groin. The problem is with um, combat sports like boxing and mixed martial arts is it really favors, because you have to sort of punch and kick, right? It favors people that are bigger and stronger, right? But if you take... That's but you're not allowed to hit the eyes and you're not allowed to hit the throat and you're not allowed to hit the groin. So in terms of self-defense or effective fighting, if you can focus on those areas, <clears throat> right, it takes the advantage away of people that are bigger, stronger, faster. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's a lot of what we're doing is looking at uh, both eye rakes where you're sort of flicking across the eye before you headbutt. We're lifting up the chin in order to elbow the throat, which wouldn't be allowed in the UFC. Basically, what you want to do is take everything that's not allowed in the UFC, right? And, and you want to do that, right? Like, you're not allowed to hit the, the, uh, the brainstem back here in, in boxing or in MMA. You want to hit that. You, uh, you want to gouge the eyes, right? You want to cup and slap and, and, and potentially burst the eardrum. You want to attack the throat, the groin. Having said that, you can't just rely on, like, having these techniques. And the, the tricky thing with that is that you can't practice them day in, day out, like you can with arm bars and chokes and punching. So what you want to do is sort of incorporate some mixed martial arts type training with thinking about these, these uh, sort of more lethal targets and also sort of building that into a framework of, you know, if you're a civilian, the sort of self-defense framework, being aware, trying to avoid certain areas, being able to talk people down, you know, posturing. There's all these other types of things that aren't quite fighting, but they're to do with de-escalating or escalating or whatever you want to do. And in a military context, um, you know, there's multiple opponents, there's weapons involved um, as well. So you sort of take it all into context. But yeah, aiming for those target areas 
that uh, don't have big muscles built over them. Uh, sort of the, you know, in the short, when you've got the short amount of time, you want to be able to focus on, on that type of stuff. You know, I use sort of these defensive postures. So I'm putting up hands where I don't look like I'm ready to fight, but I'm ready to protect myself or strike. So we call that the fence. Um, and then there's tricks you can do. So you can ask someone, so, hey, what are you trying? You ask a question. The engaged brain is easier to knock out. There's studies that have shown that. And when you get into, when you get adrenaline, you get um, a tunnel vision. And so you can't see much of your periphery. So that's also true of your opponent. So I say, hey, calm down. And once they've touched me twice, like I'm backing up, I'm saying touch me twice, I'm ready to go. Because if I keep backing up and they've touched me twice, you know, they've, you know, they've hit my fingers and I'm trying to back up. Um, then I'm going to say, hey, what are you trying to say? Or wait, don't I know your brother? You ask a question that engages the brain and you put your hand like this called exclamation fence. Uh, you, you put it outside of their uh, periphery and then bang, throw in the, the strike from there. And uh, they don't see it coming because it's from the periphery and they've got tunnel vision and you've asked a question. And a lot of times they got to answer the question. They, I say, uh, don't I know your brother? Or what are you trying to say? And they go, and they try to answer. Now their jaw is open and they're easier to get knocked out. You must have seen some gruesome injuries along the way. Like what, what's, what are some that stick out? Are the ones that you've had or ones that maybe you've inflicted on someone? Yeah, there's two, two things that come to mind. I fought someone, um, I think his name, his name was Sean Nagano, <clears throat> before the UFC. And uh, I took his arm and he wasn't tapping this Japanese guy and just had like real heart. And I was tapping it on a Kimura, uh, trying to, you know, break the shoulder, waiting for him to tap, didn't tap. And all of a sudden there's a complete tension and <laughs> feel it rip like this and then doesn't tap still more pressure, <laughs> feel it rip again until the arms completely upside down. All right. Like the elbows down here and the hands up here. Uh, and he was just so, like, I, I got a couple of things on him like that. And uh, he finally, I got him in a, in a choke, but he was in so much pain after the fight. I, I couldn't fight for a year because I felt so bad and, that I didn't want to injure someone like that again. I mean, at the end of the day, it's his fault because he should tap if it, you know, he's responsible for his own safety, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, but I felt so bad. I just didn't feel good about fighting for about a year. So that's on, on me inflicting damage. And then I fought a guy called Matt Brown uh, also known as the immortal and in my first um 30 seconds or so hit the tip of his elbow hit me in the, right in the eyeball and my orbital floor blew out so i had what's called a trapdoor fracture so the fat that holds my eye in place uh if it doesn't blow out your eye could disintegrate basically or just get crushed so it's it's a very thin bone that sits under your eye I had a trapdoor fracture that um blew out the orbital floor and uh, the fat leaked into my sinus cavity. Uh, so you basically, if you look at an X-ray or a CT scan, you see like totally empty cavity here, black space, and then over here, a bunch of white fat sitting under there. And, and that stretched out a nerve under my eye, which supplies the whole left side of my face, uh, which is still a problem to this day. So uh, for a while it was completely numb. And then after six or nine months, it became hypersensitive. And even now if I drink hot tea, um, you know, on my lip here or tongue. And at that point I was like, is this really worth it? Like $50,000 for a fight or whatever, including all the sponsorship. Is that really worth it? Would you ever want to get in the ring with someone like McGregor? Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm 43 now. Um, this is true. <laughs> I, I always like sort of fantasize against just even training with some of these top guys today, just to see the level. I think the levels got better. I think, Connor is amazing. I think there's other amazing guys like Khabib and um, Israel Adesanya. I still think GSP is probably the greatest of all time, personally. Um, but uh, yeah, I would love to, to, to just get in the ring and spar with those guys just to, to see the level. James Wilkes, thank you very much for your time, mate. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Andy. That was great. And thank you very much for listening. We'd love your feedback on the interview, so please do leave us a review and we'll be back again next week.